each person that's here, Lord, that they didn't come by accident or even by invitation, Lord God. But Father God, it's, it's you pursuing them, Lord God, that you have placed a desire in their heart to be here tonight, Father God, because you are faithful, Lord, because you love each and every one, Father God, and you want them to know you more, Father. We just thank you that you're such a good, good Father. Father, we magnify your name tonight, Lord God. You're so good and loving, Father. Father God, I just pray that you would continue, Father God, that good work which you have begun in each and every one of us, Lord God. That, Father God, that you will continue to show who you are, Father God, to each and every one of us, Lord God. Father God, that our relationship with you, Lord God, will become more and more intimate, Lord God, so that we may know you more, Father. Father, we love you tonight, Lord God. We magnify your name, Lord. There's no one like you, Father. We magnify your name, Lord God. You're worthy to be praised, Father. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for being faithful, Lord God. Never giving up on us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify your name tonight, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And I'm just going to ask that you would please put your attention on the screen for our announcements. So glad to have you here with us. We would also like to thank those of you who have joined us online. So we would like to welcome our first time guests. We're so happy you're here. Please fill out a commit card. Raise your hand if you need one, and one of our greeters will be happy to hand you one. Or scan our QR code on the screen to fill it out from your smartphone. Don't forget to download the Church Center app to keep up to date with upcoming events, giving, and being a part of small groups. Join us for our pre-service prayer before every service from 6 to 6.30 p.m. in our sanctuary. We encourage everyone to join our early morning prayer. From 5.30 to 6 a.m., we have a time of soaking. From 6 to 6.30 a.m., we pray on behalf of our city, church, and family. To participate, join the early morning prayer small group on the Church Center app to get the Zoom link. Let's agree together in prayer. Are you interested in serving by volunteering? We need your help with media, ushering, greeting, and kids ministry. Sign up sheet is in the back or see Veronica Costa. Sundays, 5 to 6.30 p.m., we have our women's, men's, and kids ministries. Women's ministry, Hearts on Fire with Ana Chavez. Men's ministry, Kingdom Men with Robert Acosta Sr. And our kids ministry, Cadet Edition with Catalina Campos. Come grow with us. We have a young women's group, Girl Time, ages 16 to 35, for a time to hang out, fellowship, and study the women in the Bible. Once a month, see Emily Pico Channel for more details. We're excited to announce our next prophetic conference, Thursday, September 7th through Saturday, September 9th. Be sure to mark your calendars for information to come. Can you play an instrument? Would you like to try out for our worship team? If so, see Mincy Acosta for more information. Do you have a desire to learn and worship God with a tambourine? Would you like to join our Unity Tambourine Group? Speak with Gloria Camirano for more information. Amen. And as you uh, may know, uh, we started to do uh, uh, first-time visitors. That if you bring a first-time visitor, they get a, a ten-dollar gift card for Starbucks. And today we have two visitors, so welcome. We have Virginia. Is it Garney? Garney, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And Angel Gonzalez, welcome, Angel. Thank you for coming to the video to start with this card. And I have the honor to introduce Prophet David Fang. He's going to do our tithes and offerings tonight. Amen. Everybody's doing good tonight? Yeah, you guys are looking really good for how hot it is out there. My goodness. I almost melted. Well, I just want to go ahead and take a moment. We're going to transition to a time of tithes and offerings. So as you guys are getting your tithes and offerings prepared, if you need an envelope or anything like that, 
uh, the ushers in the back are going to be able to hook you up and, and make that happen for you. Amen? But tonight I just wanted to encourage you about the power of sowing. Has anybody in here ever seen a breakthrough when you've invested in something? Have you ever had that moment in your life where you, you look at an opportunity, you look at something, and you're not quite sure if it's going to pan out? But then what happens is that you then take a leap of faith to be able to invest in the possibility that something might happen. You know what? That's the reason why many of us in, in, in this room uh, you know, may have uh, felt our heart begin to race a little bit when the, the lottery numbers come out and we know what the jackpot is, right? When it hits 500 million, it hits 600 million, it makes something happen on the inside of us where we realize and think, hey, you know what, if I just, what is it to invest just a dollar to see if I could win all of that money? Anybody ever been there? Is that just me? Staying up at 2 a.m. trying to figure out whether I should buy 10 tickets or 20 tickets. Is that just me? Okay, all right, well, here's the amazing thing that I love is that when it comes to giving and tithes and offerings, you're not giving into the possibility of something happening, the potential of something happening. You're investing in the number one sure thing, in the fact that as God has been faithful to give you breath in your body, as he's been faithful to be able to give you strength for you to be able to get up and to walk, that he is faithful to fulfill the things that he has spoken over your life. And, and I love it because in Malachi 3.10, it talks about uh, giving the tithes and giving the tithes to the storehouse. And, and I love this story where... Uh, or this admonition from God where he says, bring your tithe to the storehouse and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot contain. What it shows in that scripture is that it's a sure thing in the fact that God wants to bless you. And it's so amazing that tithe is the key that begins to do that and unlock that in you. But here's the other thing that's interesting is that that scripture talks about this one thing. It says, I, the Lord of heaven's armies, will command the windows of heaven to open with you. Has anybody in here ever felt like your finances were under attack? Has anybody ever felt like, man, you know what? I got a raise at the office, but with this inflation and the cost of groceries and everything, it doesn't feel much like a raise. How many of you know that with finances and money, it is not only a source of exchange, but it also is actually a medium of warfare to fight for good or for the enemy to attack you in? Right. How many of you know that resources and finances is a weapon in your hand to wage warfare? How many of you have had to experience or seen people around you that battle with generational poverty? Has anybody ever seen that? Those cycles come in. But you know what's interesting is that there's this term that's in society now where it talks about breaking the cycles of poverty and breaking generational poverty off of people. How many of you know that oftentimes money is war? And so when we give and we sow, what I love is that we give God the opportunity and the invitation to move on our life. And lastly, it's to be able to give us a place to give our gratitude. Because how many of you know that if God didn't give you anything else from this point forward, what he's given you is more than we could possibly have thought we could deserve. And so Thanksgiving is a big part of it. And so as you've got your offering, you may be at a different stage. You may be in a different season in your life where, one, you may be uh, thinking and saying, God, I need to be able to raise my faith level. I need to put a sign and a declaration saying that what you said over my life is going to come to pass. And I want to sow to that. And then some of us in here, we might be saying, I have been in the greatest fight of my life financially. And I know that this is the area where the enemy is fighting against me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my money into a weapon. I'm going to sow. I'm going to believe that the same God that called me is the same God that's fighting on my behalf. And I'm going to believe for breakthrough. And then there's that third season that some of us are in. We're in a place of gratitude. We're so thankful for the fact that God has done so much in our lives. And we want to sow into that and say, God, thank you for what you've done. 
And thank you for what you're going to do. Just raise your offerings up before the Lord. Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing with this offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. And God, I declare that regardless and no matter what season or stage your people are in tonight, God, I thank you that is a declaration of our gratitude. It's a declaration of our faith. And it's a declaration saying, God, you fight for us. And so we bless this offering in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, as the ushers are coming around, you can also uh, give online and text. You can do that. But I want to take a moment to introduce the special guest minister for tonight. Okay, I know this uh, guest speaker very, very well. We actually recently... Hmm? Oh, do we need to dismiss the children? For children's church? Oh, they're already out. Let them out. Okay, cool. Father, we bless the children. We release them to children's ministry in Jesus' name. And so tonight, I have my uh, my wonderful wife and the most anointed person that I know, Leilani, is going to be ministering tonight. We just got went on a road trip uh, together in a small 2019 Ford Fiesta. Okay, so how many of you know we got closer than we ever have before? Amen. So why don't you just give uh, give Leilani a hand as she comes up and ministers the Lord? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Um, it's so awesome to see many of you here again. Um, or see lots of new faces. And so I'm going to just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Prophet John and Meliana Hardy's daughter, their most precious gift in the world. Um, so uh, I was texting my mom this morning, and I'm going to need you all to give me a great favor, a big favor, okay? Can you guys do this for me? I promised her that I would preach amazing tonight. So when you see her next week, I need you all to like hype me up and be like, oh my gosh, Leilani did so amazing. We need to have her all the time. It was the best message. It was so anointed. People were saved, delivered, demons cast out, all of it, okay? I'm gonna need you all. Promise me you're gonna tell her that when you see her next week. Um, but before I share what God has laid on my heart, I actually wanted to minister to Nimsy. I know you're you're doing something back there, but I wanted to minister for you and your husband. Is, is he here? He's here, right? No, he's not here. He's not here? Okay, that's totally okay. Um, yeah, if you don't mind coming up, David and I, we want to minister to you. I know you're like up there, you know, leading the church. <laughs> and so, yeah, I just, um, I just got, just stretch forth your hands towards Nimsy. I just, I really saw something special on her tonight, and, and I just believe God wants to release a special word over you. And so, Father, I just thank you so much for Nimsy, Father. I thank you, Lord God, for the love that she has for you, God. I thank you, Lord, that this is her season, that this is her moment, Father, that you're getting ready to do incredible things inside of her in your name, Jesus. And Nimsy, what I saw when you're up there, actually, the, the very first word you said, I just heard the Lord say that this is your year, Nancy. This is your year. Um, I don't know what it was. I don't know what took place even 12 months, 13 months, 18 months ago. But I just saw where there was a moment where you cried out to God and you said, there, God, I'm going to make a deal with you. And you made a deal with God in that moment. And there, there are things that God is getting ready to release over you, says Lord. I just see that there is even a message inside of you. There is a prophetic voice inside of you that is getting ready to come out because I just see that you've almost been going through a personal revival where people don't really know about it they don't know what's, what's going on but God has really been downloading a special revelation inside of your heart and I want you to know that God has showed me and he has told me that he's getting ready to release a special healing and anointing to those that are close to you and so the Lord says those of the cried out for those that you have prayed for people that you have got, you have said, God, when, when are they going to come back? When am I going to see these people? When am I going to restore these relationships? I just heard the Lord say to you that my daughter get ready for this season is coming. And I just, even for you and your husband, I just saw where God is getting ready to do some financial breakthrough for the both of you. That there's a real entrepreneurial really thing that is going, like, that's happening inside, not just your husband, but you as well. So I see a partnership between the two of you where you guys are going to build not only your business, Businesses, but you're going to get multiple businesses is what I hear. Multiple. And so I also see where you guys are going to do something together and it's going to build the kingdom and it's going to be a blessing to your family, not just your immediate family, but also to your extended family yeah. as well. And Nimsy, I just heard the Lord saying that you're going to have more talents, more anointings, more skills than you realize you've ever had. And I actually saw a season many years ago where it felt like someone had put a cap on your mind. 
and, and it was almost like they, they said things and did things that really would cause you to lose your confidence in the giftings that were in you. But God wanted me to tell you that you're about to access the brilliance that he's put inside of you in a way where it's just going to flow like a river. And so I just want to pray that over you. Father, I thank you for him. I thank you that in her is an intelligence, yes. is a brilliance is a keen understanding of things, Father. And so, Father, I pray right now that you would awaken her mind and her eyes to see these new opportunities that are coming to her. God, I pray right now that she's not going to have to be afraid of being taken advantage of. She's not going to be, be afraid of taking steps forward. But, God, her faith is going to rise up in this season like never before to grab a hold of what you're going to bring into her life. So, Father, we thank you for her and the entire your family in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you Lord for what he's doing. Man, I'm just so excited to be here. I think it's been um, about a year that I, since the last time I was here and um, it's really awesome to see some new faces and to just see what God is doing here in Tucson. Um, as soon as David and I landed, there's just a couple of things that I must do as soon as I get to Tucson. One, I have to go to Dutch Bros, and two, I have to go to in and out Burger. So I just want to say thank you all for providing that opportunity for me. Um, I was very blessed. Um, so yeah, you know, um, I just want to, before I get to the word that God has laid on my heart, um, I just want to share with what he's been really speaking to me about me, even a testimony that God has has done for, for my family. Um, so about uh, fall of last year, um, I just began hearing the Lord say to me, and this was like really hard for me, you guys, because I am like the type of person that likes to do things on my own, right? I just, I feel like I can do it all by myself. I feel like I can handle things on my own. I'm so thankful for David. He, you know, God just knows when to send you someone that, that you need, right? You know, David is, is the most helpful partner and, and the best man that God could ever send to me. So yeah, he, he's awesome. Um, but I, as I was praying in the fall, I just kept hearing the Lord say to me, Leilani, you have to be more intentional with your friendships. You have to be better at making friends. So here's the thing, guys. Um, when I, you know, when you're a kid, you don't, you know, it's easy to make friends. It's easy to open yourself up. You don't have your insecurities. You don't have a lot of those things that, you know, doesn't happen to your teenage and adult life. And I think for me, growing up the way I did, um, it, a lot of times when I explain the way that I am and the way I grow up, people are like, oh, did you grow up in a military family? And I'm like, no. You know, I, I, I grew up with my parents who, from the time that I was eight years old, um, that is when they started full-time ministry. And so, you know, they, they have, for, since I was eight, I'm 35 now, um, they have been doing the exact same thing that they're doing now, traveling nonstop, different churches every week. And I was homeschooled, my brother and I were homeschooled. And so, because through a lot of my childhood, I was brought up in that environment, I realized later on in my adult life that I had really no attachment to people or places. I didn't really feel like I had a hometown or, or I mean, I'm sure I had friends and, and all of these things, but it's like I would make friends in this in like this one church in like Redding, California, which is like Northern California, and I would go make a friend in LA. And so, you know what I mean? I, I, these were, this was the type of environment I grew up in, and I'm not saying that that is a bad thing because I, I know had I not gone through my childhood like that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be who I am today. But I just want to give you context for how in my adult life I realized that it was harder for me to make friends with people because I would not get attached to people and I would not get attached to places. And so I find myself last fall, you know, David's traveling a lot and, you know, I, I'm so thankful that we have my two wonderful children and, and they're amazing. And um, this past year, they're so busy with their gymnastics, their acting and all these different they have going on, right? And I'm realizing that a lot of my time is, in, you know, I'm just investing in my children, which is what God wants us to do. And God wants us to invest into our children. And I begin to realize I'm doing a lot of this by myself. And my conversations I'm only having with my husband and my children and nobody else. And to me, it's fine. But the Lord begins to convict me. And he begins to, you know, like I said earlier, you need to be more intentional about friendships. 
And so here's the thing. All my life you've been told that I'm super intimidating and it's hard to, you know, it's, I, I, I'm scary at first and all these things, right? And so I tell myself, I go to the gym and I'm like, okay, just, just look like David. Just sit there with a smile on your face and while you're smiling at nothing, right? That's one of the things I noticed about him when we first got married. I'm like, what are you smiling at? Like, come on, you know? And so, you know, I'm like practicing my best David face. And, and David has told me that at times where I think I'm smiling, I'm actually not. So I'm sitting there getting ready for class to start and I'm trying my best to look less intimidating and to be more approachable, right? And um, as I, you know, was, you know, working out and stuff, um, I did have one friend at the gym, so I don't want you guys to think like I had like no friends. I did have one, okay? And she's amazing, actually, she was here last year, my friend Mercy. Um, she introduces me to this woman, and she's like, oh, she has a daughter the same age as your daughter. And she actually goes to gymnastics too. And so, you know, that's my in, right? I'm like, oh, I have something to talk about her with. Because guys, I'm actually like really bad at small talk. It's not my favorite thing. I feel super awkward. And so I'm like, okay, that's my in. I can talk about that. So I can talk about my daughter all day long and her gymnastics and all that, right? So we begin to talk a little bit here and there. Um, a couple days later, my friend does my friend Mercy doesn't go to the gym with me, right? And um, my friend me, the, the woman I had just met, her name's Lena, um, she's there by herself that day too. And so because we had just met, I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something really brave, I'm gonna be bold, I'm gonna have her be my partner in this workout, right? So I'm like, okay. I can do this. I can be, I don't have to, I won't be awkward. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to be super nice and all these things, right? So I do that and I, you know, I tell her like, oh yeah, my daughter just started dance class at this dance studio. Um, I'm not sure if your daughter's into that, but they're, they're taking enrollment if you want to join. And she says to me, oh yeah, actually I'm looking for a place for my daughter too. And I, I do want to sign her up. She signs her up that day and I see her the next evening. At, um, at dance, and I'm sitting there and talking to her, and I just hear the, like, the Lord tell me, like, get to know this woman, get to know her, ask her what her and her husband do, um, ask them, ask them about their life, and be interested, don't just pretend you're interested, like, actually be interested, like, honey, right, so, I know, I'm just, like, putting myself out here, right, um, so I do that, right, and I'm, like, asking her, and she's like, oh, yeah, my husband, he does, like, um, like, what is it called? Like, not the counseling, but what's that? You guys? Coaching. coaching. You do like life coaching. Um, but we also run like a car rental service. So, where we live in Florida is a very high tourist area um, between the two cities that we live between. We have about 9 million tourists visit annually. So, it's a very busy beach town, especially through the months of March and October, right? And so she's telling me about her car rental service. I'm like, that's so cool, right? Um, later on, a couple months go by, and you know, I, at this point, this one is like my BFF, right? A couple months later, like we hung out multiple times. Our daughters go on playdates all the time. She's my friend at this point. Um, David is is leaving for about a month, and I see it, and I'm like, hey. You should go ask Nina's husband if we can put our car with their car rental service, right? And he's like, oh yeah, it's a great idea because we won't need two cars this month. And I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. So we end up doing it and it ends up being like super successful. Like the car's running out basically the entire month and everything's like that. And while we're going through this, our second car, the lease is getting ready. We had a lease and the lease is getting ready to expire. And Dean and I are trying all these different ways, you know, to, to get into a new vehicle, and we're having a hard time. And Dean and I, we go on a, a short vacation, it was during spring break, and we go on a short vacation, and I'm just like, okay, Lord, I want you to do something miraculous for us in this area. I want you to do something that's going to be a blessing to our family. And as Dean and I are kind of like figuring out what we should do, what our next step should be with, with our other car, because I didn't want to take our car off the car rental service, I heard the Lord say, okay, instead of buying one expensive new car, buy a used car and buy a less expensive new car. 
right? And with your used car, go ahead and put it on the rental service, okay? So I hear God say this and I'm like, okay, we got this. Go ahead and miracle after miracle, and instead of getting one car, God provides me with two cars, right? So now I'm up to three cars, guys. I'm up to three cars at this point. And I'm like, you know what? Let me just go ahead and list them all. Let me just go ahead and, you know, I'll figure it out. And you guys, in this moment where like Dave and I are like, okay, God, we know you, we know that you want ministry for us. We know that this is it. But we also know that there are things in the business world that you want to provide for us. How many of you know that God also wants things for you, not just inside of ministry, but also inside of business? Right? And so we begin to do this and things begin to, to take off and things begin to get even better in this. And what has happened is I looked back on it and I realized like, had I not heard the Lord to develop the friendship with this woman, I would not be in the position that I am today where I have rented my cars while I'm traveling. And actually my dad actually gave me his car that I'm going, I'm driving back to rent. And people have been calling David and saying, hey man, can you take my car and rent it out? Can you do this? And here God has provided opportunity after opportunity because of a relationship that I chose to say yes to. Amen? And you know what's so crazy in the midst of this is that after we had even bought those cars, God even provided a way to buy um, our daughter Grace. She just graduated from high school last weekend. God provides a way for us to buy her a nice car for her to go to college in, low mileage, and a newer vehicle. And here I went from maybe having one and a half cars to having multiple cars because of the goodness of God and because I was obedient and went out of my comfort zone. Many times it is hard for us to go out of our comfort zone. Guys, I will be the first one to tell you I love being comfortable. Like, I love for you guys. I have the best bed and the best comforter and the best sheets. Like, I am telling you, I love to be comfortable. But there are some moments where God has asked us to become uncomfortable. And what happens is we, when we obey him, we realize that there is a blessing waiting for us on the other side of that uncomfortableness, amen? And it's so cool, you know, our, our friends that we've been doing this business with, Dave and I have been traveling uh, a lot the past couple of weeks, and, and they're just taking care of it for us, you know what I mean? Like, and I sometimes I'm like, David, make sure they're okay, I don't wanna be a burden. And he's like, they love you. You just have to let people help you, okay? They're fine, they're happy, they're happy, they wanna do this for us. And I was like, okay, but I don't wanna be a burden, because that's just how I am. But there are times where I, you know, when I told you guys earlier, like, it is hard for me. It is so hard for me to want to ask for help. But God has shown me that through the power of relationship, there are people that I can rely on and people that God can use to be a blessing to my family. Amen. And so I wanted to share that with you because I really do think that we're entering to a season where we do have to place value in the relationships that God has for us. And as I was asking the Lord this morning, what he wanted me to share with you guys, I was begin to read about Paul and Barnabas. How many of you are familiar with Paul and Barnabas? Um, Barnabas, they don't really consider him one of the 12 apostles, but he was an apostle. Um, I'm going to take you to um, Acts chapter 9, verse 26. So here comes Saul, right? He is like the worst of the worst. Right? He is persecuting Christians left and right. People hate him. People despise him. Yet he has this amazing transformation happen where the Holy Spirit moves on him and he becomes radically saved. When I picture Paul in this, we call him Saul at this point, but when I picture him, I picture this super on fire man of God that probably has like no chill, right? You guys ever notice my dad gets like super excited and his like gets all intense and like his eyes get big and all this stuff? This is how I imagine Paul 24 7 at this point in his life, right? So um, he, he gets saved at Damascus and he gets kicked out and, and so he goes to Jerusalem and that's what we, what we see here. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. 
they did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. What really stands out to me in this chapter is here Saul comes, right? Probably like looking crazy, with crazy hair, crazy eyes, on fire for the Lord, and people are like, no man, like we don't do this here. Like you're a little too radical for us. And yet there's this man by the name of Barnabas who says, you know what? Wait a second. I actually think this guy's all right. I think we should let him in. What's really interesting is if we read later on in Acts 11 to 24, you see Barnabas' character. And I actually do want to read this scripture for you from the Amplified Bible because I think there's a lot of truth that's here. And it's in... Um, Acts 11, verse 22. Um, Acts 11, verse 22. I'm going to start there. Just give me a second to get here. So this revival has broken out, right? In, in Antioch. And they send Barnabas there. And when he's there, he, it says right here in verse, in, uh, verse 23, when he arrived and saw the grace of God that was bestowed on them, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with an unwavering heart to stay true and devoted to the Lord. But here's where we see who Barnabas was. For Barnabas was a good man, privately and publicly. His godly character benefited both himself and others, and he was full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith in Jesus the Messiah, through whom believers have everlasting life, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. It is then in this, in this chapter that we see the type of man that Barnabas was. I don't know about you guys, that's the kind of reputation I want to have. You know what I mean? I want to be known as someone who not just publicly is a good person, who not just publicly is full of faith, who not just publicly loves the Lord, but who privately loves the Lord. Because I'm telling you something, I think there is there is such a heavy, heavy, heavy anointing on the fact that he was he was a man, the man he was in private. Amen. I, that means that he prayed every day. That means that he inhaled the word of the Lord every single day. That means he was obedient. And what that means is he was righteous. You know, uh, you know, last year, I was telling you, Yolani, you need to be more righteous. And you know, that, may look, that looks different for every person. We all have our own convictions. But for me, that was the type of music that I listened to. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, okay, you know what? I shouldn't consume. There might not be bad words or bad things in the music that I listen to, but they're not glorifying the Lord. And if I'm allowing my children to listen to music that is not glorifying the Lord, not only am I hurting myself, but I could potentially also be hurting them. And so the Lord began to convict me of that. And so, you know, I begin show, asking the Lord, Lord, show me things in my life, little things my life that I'm not living righteously because who cares that I can stand up in front of the church and give a nice message or, or say a nice prophetic word lots of us can do that many people can do that but if I am not righteous if I am not a good person in my private life if I do not if I do if I am not honoring of my children or honoring of my spouse who am I then to get on a pulpit and tell people to be righteous, right? And so the Lord began to share this with me, began to tell me to walk this way. And so what I love about Barnabas was that he was known, and if you see what the scripture says, not only did it benefit him, because yeah, I'm sure he was super blessed, but it benefited others. That means it benefited his family. It benefited his church. It benefited his friends. And so, um, you know, as I was reading, you know, more about his life and, and more about 
about who Barnabas was and, and who Paul was at this time in Scripture, um, it's really interesting because, you know, I just explained that he, you know, Barnabas, he was amazing. There's one thing about him. Homeboy was a people pleaser. Okay? Do you guys know people pleasers? I do. And, um, you know, but he, here's the thing about him being a people pleaser. Um, he had a high value on relationships. He really, truly, deeply cared about other people. Whereas Paul, on the other hand, it was all truth. And that was it. It was black and white for a homeboy. It was right or wrong. There was a passion. There was a zeal for him. But how many of you know that we need people like that? We need people with that type of passion. We need people who only see black and white. I'm going to say, you guys, I am one of those people that see black and white. And I am so glad that I am married to someone who is sometimes a people pleaser. But you know what I mean, you guys? Like, there, there, you know, we are not all the same. There are people that God puts into our lives that we might not see eye to eye with. We might not understand their perspective. We might not see things. And that's what makes up the body of Christ, right? That's what makes us so unique and different because we're able to work together to build up the kingdom. And so um, what's really interesting then is in Acts 12, verse 25, um, this man by the name of John Mark enters the picture, right? So Paul tells, or they're telling each other, hey, let's go on this mission trip. Let's go spread the gospel around the world. Let's go travel. Let's go do all this stuff. Let's go be John and Billy on our here. Right? It's probably the conversation that Barnabas and Paul were having. And so they decide to take a young man with them by the name, um, he sometimes goes by John, he sometimes goes by Mark, they just call him John Mark, and he, he is a young man, he, um, not much is known about him other than the fact that he was from a ministry family. His mom, very wealthy, very successful, led an amazing ministry inside of her home. I'm sure, when I picture it, I don't know if you guys are familiar, um, Bethel High's um, the Sozo, this is what I picture um, John Mark's mom's ministry like, where you just go in and you're soaking and you're getting healed and you know you're just getting refreshed and renewed. That's the type of ministry I picture John Mark's mom has, right? And so everything's chill, right? And she's healthy, so everything's very comfortable for him. So he goes on this mission trip with Barnabas and Paul, and you know they're going through. Um, they're ministering, things are cool, but then they get to this point in the story where they're at this, where they're at this city, and when they're at this city, there is a warlock, well they call him a sorcerer, warlock, whatever, he man is demon possessed, right? He starts telling, one of the, one of the officials of the city wants to hear the message that Barnabas and Paul have, and so they're, He's like saying, okay, like bring them to me, I want to meet them, I want to see them. But this warlock is like, no man, you shouldn't see them. Like, you don't need them. Like, I got all the answers for you, I got all this, right? So Paul, remember, Paul is like on fire. He is radical. He's not afraid of no witches or warlocks or anything like that, right? He, he goes over to the man and he casts out the demon. Just right there and then. Didn't even ask Barnabas what protocol. He just didn't care, right? And so at this point in the story, Barnabas is Paul's mentor. And, you know, he does what I, what's so interesting is that I love that Paul always acts out of his impulse and what God is doing in that moment. And Barnabas never seems to hold him back, to hold back the passion that Barnabas, or that Paul has. And so he's like casting out the devil, the man goes blind, people get saved, like it's super crazy, right? It's not what's happening really yet, like a nice sozo where you're soaking, you're just crying, and, you know, things like that. Um, so what happens then is all it says in scripture is John Mark leaves. He just says, I'm not, I'm going on. What I think happened is it was too rough for the boy. He is a mama's boy, and he wants to go home to his mom because yeah. ministry life is too hard, right? He's soft. 
Yeah, he's super soft. It's not for him. He can't do it, right? And honestly, guys, ministry is hard. I mean, those of you who have been serving in this in this church, I mean, it's been what, like two years now, right? And it's not easy. People come and go. And it's not for the faint of heart, especially when you're trying to build a new work, which is exactly what Paul and Barnabas were doing. They were building a new work. They were spreading the gospel. They were trying to establish churches. And this man decides, you know what? I'm just going to go home. This is not for me. I don't have it in me. I don't know where I get to sleep each night. I have to eat all this super weird food that I'm not used to. Like, I got, I don't even know where I'm going to sleep. I want to go to go back to my really nice bed. I want to go back to my really nice sheets. I want to be comfortable, right? John Mark wants to be comfortable. And who can blame him, right? We can't judge him, guys. I mean, ministry is hard. And, um, you know what's so interesting is sometimes people come and go in our lives and it really hurts, right? How many of you have lost relationships, friendships, family members over disagreements or things of things, and it has really, really, really crushed you, right? And even though scripture doesn't say what happened, all it just says is that he left. We find out later in this story that Paul and Barnabas get into an argument about John Mark. So they go on and they finish their first mission trip. Things are awesome. They're back and they're comfortable in Antioch, you know, and it, Time goes by, they're building the church, things are cool. Then all of a sudden, Paul gets to start seeing ants. He's like, I gotta go, I gotta go. We gotta go check on our churches. We gotta go see how things are going. Okay, you guys, I, I'm sure you have shared this before, but during the pandemic, and if you know my father, it was very, very hard for him to sit still. No way, it was only like six weeks, right? For him, yeah, six weeks, you guys, for my dad not traveling, it was really, really hard for him. Right? He would like get on the phone to his past with his pastor friends and he would pace the house back and forth. I mean, you guys already know he paces when he preaches, he goes like back and forth, right? But he is pacing the house. And we're all of us, David and I, my two kids, my mom, all of us are listening to my father's conversations. I don't know about this. This is not biblical. This is not, we need to be preaching the world. They should, they should be shutting down churches, right? <laughs> so I imagine that Paul is similar to this. Right? He's like, I can't sit still any longer. We need to travel. We need to spread the gospel. We need to do all these things. And what happens then is Barnabas says, all right, I'm down. Like, we've done good here. Our first mission trip was a success. Let's go. But he says to him, but I want to bring John Mark. Right? Here's the interesting thing about John Mark. He's actually a relative of Barnabas. Um, and it says in scripture that things got sharp between Barnabas and Paul. What does that mean? They got to a heated argument. And what's interesting is we know that Paul is this amazing theologian who knows so much about the word, right? We know that he has accepted Gentiles. He has loved Gentiles more than any Jewish ever had, Jew has ever had. And yet, when it comes to this, comes to John Mark, he doesn't want anything to do with him. And some may look at it and be like, you know what? It's because they were related. That's why Barnabas wanted John Mark. It's because they were related. It says in scripture that it was at that point that Barnabas and Paul split ways. And you know, sometimes when we look up the breakup of relationships, or we look at these things, we think that, oh no, something's wrong. Someone must have missed God. Someone must have done something wrong. Someone made a mistake. Someone is not hearing the Lord correctly. Look at how successful Paul and Barnabas were in their first mission trip. Look now, Barnabas is allowing a relative to get in the way of his destiny. How many of you can look at that story and see that it is very easy to see how that is perceived here? It even People even see that the, early, that the early church at the time agreed more with Paul than Barnabas. And I, David and I were talking about today, and I said, it's because they were related. It's because Barnabas and John Mark were related that people were unable to see the potential inside of John Mark. 
What's interesting as if we look at this story, you know, Paul goes on, he goes with Silas. Amazing things begin to happen in his life. People are transformed. People are set free. People are, are worshiping Jesus. And not much is known about Barnabas, except we know that he goes to Cyprus, where he is from, and he takes John Mark with him, and they too begin to preach the gospel. So if you look at it, there wasn't ever any theological dispute between the two of them. There wasn't something that they disagreed on in regards to the light. But Barnabas never once let that get in the way of the anointing that Paul had on his life. And even so, you know, as what I love even more about their relationship, at one point Barnabas is the mentor, but something changes where Paul then becomes the mentor. And not once is Barnabas jealous of Paul's position. He is not envious. He's not, hey man, I'm the one who got you here. I should get the credit for this. Not once does he do any of that. Instead, he serves faithfully at the church alongside Paul and all the other apostles. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be like Barnabas. I don't want to, I don't want to judge people. I don't want to, I don't want to let people or, or my own personal feelings get in the way of what God has for someone else. I know that there are times where we have done that and things that we have done where we have let our own personal outlook get in the way of what God is doing in the life of someone else and if then what it can do if we allow the enemy, because the enemy can use that. The enemy can come and make him cause division. Right? And so it may look in scripture like it was division, but we see very clearly that it was not. Instead, that multiple people got blessed. Multiple people were transformed. Because Paul was only one man, right? Paul was just one man. And yet he, but Barnabas is able to take, what I love, Barnabas, he takes um, John Mark, and, and we don't actually see anything more about them until later on. You know what's interesting? The next time we hear about him is when Paul is in prison. How interesting is that, right? And I actually want to read that to you. Um, it's in um, Colossians. I thought I didn't let me hear you. Colossians 4, verse 10. So Paul's in prison, and he's writing his letter. And I'm going to start here. Um, he's talking about someone else in prison with him. And he's, then he begins to talk about Mark. He says, As does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instru instructions. That means that John Mark was serving alongside Paul in the ministry. If he comes to you, welcome him. What a heart Paul has at this point in his life. That even though in my younger years I was upset about the choices that Barnabas made, and I probably looked to Paul like Barnabas had chose John Mark over him, over the ministry, we see that Paul has a heart change. It's okay to change our minds towards people, right? It's okay that God can use someone and he can change someone and he can grow them to be a powerful man and woman of God and that our heart will change towards them and we begin to accept them. And yet here we see where Paul also puts his reputation at risk and says, go ahead and welcome him. And what I love about this scripture, verse, verse 11, he said, these are the only fellow workers in the kingdom of God um, who are Jewish Christians, basically. And they have been it proved to be an encouragement and a comfort to me. So if we look at that scripture, and we see that here Paul might have been in one of the lowest moments of his life. We see that God uses John Mark, a man, a young man, that Paul had once cast aside and be like, man, I don't want anything to do with him. He's, he, he doesn't have, he doesn't, he's not cut out for ministry like He doesn't have the same passion. He doesn't have the same zeal. He's not aggressive enough. Yet we see inside of scripture here that in this moment, in one of Paul's darkest moments where he's in prison, he says, he has been an encouragement to me. 
What's interesting is the name Barnabas means son of encourager, son of encouragement. Barnabas himself was an encouragement. How many of you believe in setting and leaving behind a legacy? Not just a, leg a legacy for your family, but also a legacy of the gift that God has given you. How many of you know that there's each and every single one of us has a gift that God wants us to leave a legacy behind for the next generation? Here's the thing, Barnabas has this revelation very early on. And I believe that is why he fights so hard for John Mark. It's not because he's related to him, but it's because he knows that, here's the thing, Barnabas meets Paul when he's a little bit, when, when, when Barnabas is a little bit older. Paul's got his own thing going on. Barnabas knows that Paul's not the man that Barnabas is gonna leave his legacy behind to. He doesn't have the demeanor, he doesn't have the personality, and he's just not built the same. But, but Barnabas sees John Mark, and he says, that's the one that I want to leave my legacy behind. So in the last few days that I have here on earth, I want to invest in this young man. Because I know that there is a destiny and a potential that he has. I know that there is something that this young man is going to bring into the church. And we begin to see, and what I love, I love how they use that, how Paul uses that word. He was an encourager. They're an encouragement to me. That means Barnabas, successful in his ministry of leaving behind a legacy to encourage his brothers in Christ, even in their lowest moments. And as we look and we see the life of Barnabas and the legacy that he leaves behind, you know what's so interesting to me is, you know, Paul, he goes on to write, the very famous fruits of the Spirit. And what I love about that is early on in Paul's life, he doesn't really display too many of those fruits, right? Like, none, actually. Like, doesn't have self-control. He's definitely not patient, right? He doesn't have a lot of these things. But what we do see is Barnabas, early in Paul's life, does demonstrate a lot of these things. He's so incredibly patient with Paul. He is so incredibly loving. One of the first things Barnabas did to join ministry before Paul entered the picture was he sold his field and he just gave all the money to the church. That's, that is a love for the Lord, right? And then we, we see all of these things that were demonstrated to Paul early on in his life. You know, I believe that it was through things that Paul learned in his ministry as he became a more mature leader, right? As he became... Um, maybe less abrasive, less um, confronting, which I'm sure he still was, because that was his personality. But he began to have a deeper love for the people that God has sent to sign in his life. And, you know, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for Barnabas, you guys, if he didn't set aside his own personal reputation, his own, everything that, that was important to, for him, if he didn't set aside that just for Paul, we wouldn't have what is known today as one of the greatest theologians to ever exist. But it is through the life of Barnabas, I mean, it is through, it's because God had used him to, to, to raise up Paul for a season, right? Just for a season. And that's okay. People come and go, and they're here for a season. But God uses him in that season so that the entire world, the entire world, can learn from the teachings of Paul. I, a lot of our Christian values today are based on the revelation and the teaching of Paul. A lot of the things that we believe in is because of Paul, because of the revelation that God had put on him. But just think, if Barnabas would be like, you know what? Who was me too crazy? He's a little bit too radical for us here in Jerusalem. I don't think this is going to work out. But he didn't do that. He accepted him with open arms never said a bad word, even when things were in south. He loved him unconditionally, and he really did display the heart of a true leader. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be a leader like Barnabas. I want to have the love for people like Barnabas does. I was telling this to David every t t earlier today, and he goes, me too. And I was like, babe, you are Barnabas. It's just so nice, right? I want to be like that. 
you know? And what's, what I love about God and what I love about what he's teaching and what he's growing us into me is, you know, every day we strive to get closer and closer to him. But if we're not willing to open our ears and our hearts to what he is saying for us to do, no matter how uncomfortable it is, even if our reputation may be at risk, maybe for me, maybe for, for you, for you it might look different. You might like being friends with people. You might like making friends. You know? But could it be that God has asked us in this time and in this season to have a heart like Barnabas did? To have a love for people the way Barnabas did, so that we too can leave behind the legacy and we can raise up the next generation of people who will encourage the kingdom of God. Because I don't know about you guys, but I could use a lot of encouragement. Every day, I need encouragement. There's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of crazy things happening in our world. I mean, guys, it's Bible. You know what I mean? We need a lot of encouragement. We need to love people. We need to we need to go out there. We need to, to spread the love of Jesus. And so I'm gonna invite David and then he's gonna lead us into a time of prayer. And I just want we wanna just pray this over us that God God would begin to soften our hearts and use us in this way. Even as Leilani was talking, I, the one thing that really stuck out on me was the fact that with Paul and Barnabas, even though they had totally different approaches to ministry, how many of you feel like your approach to life is a little different than the other people that you know? Some of you may have approached and made decisions that people in your life do not agree with. And what I love about Paul and Barnabas is that despite their choices and despite the way that they approach life, they did not allow it to displace them from being able to invest and pour out to the people around them. And even as Leilani was talking, I just felt so strongly that there are many of us in here, we know what it is to be displaced because of conflict. We know what it is to feel like we've missed out on our season and we've missed out on opportunity because of how other people responded or how we responded in a situation. And sometimes when we're not careful, we can believe and think that our value and our ability to give and pour into people is well in our in our rear view mirror. But I want to tell you that even as Leilani was talking, I just heard the Lord saying, you have to know that your greatest years of fruitfulness are in front of you. That you have to know that even though it didn't turn out the way that you thought it would, even though you didn't think uh, that people did the right thing by you, the fact of the matter is, is that just like Paul impacted people and Barnabas did, you have the capacity to as well. And so I want to invite you to stand up right where you are. I want to pray this over you. I want to release this over you. Father, even as uh, there are so many here uh, tonight, Father, that they are here not just to hear a message, but Father, each and every one is here because they want to be able to be a blessing to the people around them. They want to be able to step into a place where you can use them in an amazing way. God, I thank you that you've designed each and every one of us for relationship, for connection, for being able to pour into other people as they pour into us. And God, I pray right now for our hearts, for some of us, where we have had walls, not because we don't want to connect with people, but because people have sometimes showed their worst side to us. And we're not sure who we can trust. We're not sure what's, whether we're able to, to lean in all the way. God, I pray right now that you would heal our hearts from the season of betrayal, from the season of disagreement. Father, from the areas where even just like Paul, he, when he was Saul, he was blind, he was alone, he was isolated. And he didn't know who he could trust. And, and all he knew is that he could not see. God, I know that there are some of us in here, we feel that because of what has happened to us, that we cannot see. And we don't even know how to ask for help. We don't even know how to be able to reach out to people. We think that we're alone. And God, I thank you that even in Saul's life, when he was blind and he couldn't see, you spoke to Ananias. And you sent Ananias to come into Paul's darkness into his darkness to help him to be able to see. God, I thank you right now that this season, you're going to open up relationships that are going to pour into us 
that are going to cause us to be able to see. Father, I say right now that relationships are going to come into our life where they're not going to take from us. They're not going to rob us. They're not going to kick us while we're down, but they're going to come and lay hands on us. They're going to invest in us so that we can see a future that we thought was lost. Father, I thank you for that. Now, in Jesus' name, I just felt like some of you, you felt that darkness trying to reach into your heart, reach into your soul, trying to make you feel like there's not a way forward. And Father, I thank you tonight that that shifts out of their life in the name of Jesus. One more thing I want to pray for you is that God wants you to know that just because you weren't ready before does not mean that you're not going to be ready now. And there are some of you that God has brought back around the mountain. He's brought back opportunities. He's opened up doors to you. And part of you wants to step through the open door. But part of you is afraid because you're saying, I don't know. The last time I tried it, I went home early. The last time I tried it, I was intimidated by the strange food. I was intimidated by how people behave. And I backed out. And I felt like such a failure. I don't want to do that again. And God says... Just maybe who you were then is not the person you are now. What you went through back then is not going to define you in your season now. And I love this about John Mark, even as, as Leilani was talking and preaching, is that John Mark couldn't handle a missions trip to a city with running water and plumbing. But at the end of the ministry of Paul, Paul writes a letter to Timothy and says, bring John Mark with you. And I want him to minister to me and encourage me. This is the crazy thing about John Mark is that John Mark, who is afraid to minister in a city, is willing to go to the darkest prison in the most depraved city in the entire land simply to encourage one man. The very man that called him soft. The very man that said he wasn't up for the challenge. And at the end of the ministry, John Mark was so changed. He was so transformed. He wasn't just kind. He wasn't just compassionate. He was courageous. He walked with a strength where he said, I will go to the darkest prison to encourage one man. Father, I pray right now for every single one here tonight that God, even if they weren't qualified before, it doesn't mean that you haven't been training them, growing them, pouring into them in this season where you're going to redefine them for the season that's in front of them. So, Father, right now, we let go of fear. We let go of feeling like we're disqualified, feeling like maybe we're not ready. Father, I thank you that when you open the door, you're going to open our eyes to see Father, I thank you that in each and every one of us is a desire to reach people in dark places. And Father, we say, do it in us. Just right now, just raise your hands up high. Father, if, if you're saying, God, I want this to be me. I want to be a Paul, but I also want to be a Barnabas. And I don't just want to be them. I want to be a John Mark that is willing to be so changed that people once doubted what God had put in me before, or reaching out saying, I need what you have. Father, do what you did in them, do it in us. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And Teresa, I just heard the Lord saying for you that this thing that you're doing with the Instagram, this encouragement, this is your John Mark moment. Because the Lord says that what you've been doing in this season is so contrary to your personality Many people don't realize that how calm and confident you are on camera hides the fact that you're streaming internally because it's so against your nature. And God wanted me to tell you that he's proud of you for having made this commitment to be a voice. And God says, let me grow the platform underneath you in ways that you couldn't imagine. I saw God bringing a Barnabas into your life that is going to know how to speak the language of your heart and show you that there's more to you than you realize. And so God says, get ready. He's going to launch you. He's going to shoot you out like an arrow. But he's going to have people in your corner that are going to help you. I just heard the Lord say, you guys stop discounting yourself. 
and you've got to stop feeling like you don't have any. Now there are choices that you may have made and things that you may have done, but the Lord says to you, Teresa, the promise that I made to you two years ago is still the promise that I have for you today. And so, Father, right now, Lord God, we declare the word of the Lord that is spoken over her life two years ago, Father. That you have not discounted her, Father. There is nothing she has done that you have you have said that is not something that I can no longer have. Lord, we know that there is a ministry. We know that there is a calling on her life. And we thank you, God, that you have brought her here tonight to remind her of the precious gift she is, not just to her family, Father, but to the body of Christ. And so right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, there will no longer be the negative self-talk. There will no longer be any of the doubt Right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare that there is a freedom inside of her mind. That there is a freedom that she's getting ready to walk in. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, as your presence, Lord, begins to fall upon her, Lord. As you begin to bring comfort to her heart. I pray right now, Lord God, that you are going to show her just how much you value her, Lord God. Just how much the body of Christ needs her. But also how much she needs them. And so we declare this over her in Jesus' name. And actually, just right here, the gentleman right over here, tell me your name. Angel? Angel, I, I don't know what you do for a living. I don't know if you're currently working, but I saw God beginning to come down and reach you where you are. And God says there's transition in your life that's going to be much more than what you thought it was going to be. And where you thought that you were in a holding pattern, where you thought that you were stuck, God says he's going to bring a new door of opportunity for you. It's almost like a complete and total career change for you. And God says the reason why is because he knows that you're a hard worker. But now he wants to show you that there's wisdom and there's skills inside of you that are going to take that hard work mentality and multiply it so you can bless the family that's in your life. God says that you're not a survivor of this last season. You're not just someone that just made it through. God says you have been made by the last season to be a champion for people that desperately need help. And so God says you're not a second option. You're not a third option. What God is going to do in this season is, one, he's going to meet you like he met Paul. Two, what he's going to do is going to show you that there's more opportunity than you realize. And third, what he's going to do is he's going to show you that you are not the reason for people's heartbreak. You're a reason for them to stand in faith. And so, Father, right now, I release over Angel that he is a man that knows what it is to have to make hard choices. And sometimes he has questioned and he said, Lord, I don't think I made the right ones. I'm not sure if what I did was the right move. And God, I thank you that you're turning those decisions into opportunity that's going to shift the entire next season of his life. God, I thank you right now. He's not a survivor. He's a champion. God, you're going to show him that he's going to be a champion for others like never before. So, Father, we release that now over him in Jesus' name. So I just want to invite you one last time to raise your hand. Father, we pray a blessing over your people tonight. I thank you that you're going to speak about relationship. You're going to speak about pouring in. Father, I thank you that you're going to even bring relationships back into our life. That we thought were gone, but Father, they're going to come back in and bless us in amazing ways. And God, we just pray that over every single one here. That God, as they go out, that you would confirm this word. And that you would bless them with confirmation after confirmation. And just even as this last, as we close tonight, I want to encourage you. That one part of Leilani's story where she talks about how God made a way for us to get cars. Listen, I don't know if y'all know what it is to be at the end of your rope and hit like ground zero, right? But that car thing was very tough because we had been to dealership after dealership. And I, I, we were doing this whole thing. And I said, God, we're going to stand in faith. And this is what I love is that we went to one of the last dealerships we hadn't been to in the city. And you know what happened is that it was a high volume dealer. They, if you don't buy the car, they're going on to the next person. It was crazy. There was no real way in the natural it was going to happen. Can I tell you that we walk in through the doors and what happens is this tropical light storm brews outside of this car dealership where people can't get in, get out. And we are the only ones in this car dealership. 
So the entire sales department and the entire finance department is focused on David and Leilani for the next three and a half hours. And can I tell you, they found the one bank that was able to do the financing. They found the right numbers that were going to work. And I just want to tell you that when you do what you can with what God is speaking over your life, what happens is heaven moves to be able to reinforce and back you up. Father, I pray and declare over your people yes. tonight yes. that heaven will yes. reinforce yes. what they're going to do on behalf of what you've called them to yes. in the name of Jesus. If you believe it, say amen. Amen, amen and amen. Well, I want to let you guys know we love you and we're going to miss you. I'm not going to miss the heat because I feel like a, a frozen pizza in the middle of an oven. Okay, but we love you guys and we can't wait to see you. And I hope that it's not the year goes by before I know how to come back. That's partially my fault, so I forgive. Please forgive me. But please, again, don't forget to tell my mom and my dad. That's <laughs> that's that's awesome. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to, to Veronica again. Thank you guys so much for, for being a blessing to David and I, but also for being a blessing to my mom and dad. Um, I know that they're so proud of their church here in Tucson, and they really do love you guys a lot. So thank you again for, for loving them back. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that great word. You guys, thank you for coming out tonight. We love you. See you guys on Sunday. Don't forget, 5 to 6.30. And 